Welcome everybody, thank you for joining me. Today I'm going to be doing a podcast on the sciences. I'm calling it 7 New Things About the Brain. As normal, or as usual, I guess I would say, I will put a link to the article in the description. I usually just read the article word for word here and there, putting a little bit of my uh, two cents in. This is Seven New Things We've Learned About the Brain by Kevin Dickinson, 2019. Oh, this is a pretty old one. Brain plasticity, mindful superpowers. Pokemon invading your gray matter? Scientists have only begun to learn about the human brain. These are the points of the article. In, 19, in 1848, Phineas Cage kicked off our modern neuroscience after blasting a tamping iron through his skull. We explore seven things scientists have since learned about this important complex organ. Many mysteries remain, such as where consciousness originates and how we evolved such a multi-purpose mind. So this is from the Big Think website. As I said, it's from Kevin Dickinson. I will go through the article, and I'll start now. In 1848, Phineas Cage, is it Cage or Gage? Yeah, Gage, was laying on railroad tracks in Cavendish, Vermont. As he was packing the powder, the charge detonated prematurely, launching the tamping iron, a three and a half foot long, one inch thick, and 13 and a half pound spear of pure metal through his head. It entered through his left cheek, passed behind his eye, and launched the top out the top of his head to land 30 yards away. Gage miraculously survived, though he was obviously not unfazed. Normally a thorough man, Gage could no longer follow up with plan. His friends complained that he was no longer himself. While he recovered enough to live a normal life, even moving to Chile to become a carriage driver, the traumatic injury had changed him. Gage's story has been retold in countless psychology textbooks and exaggerated through countless retellings. He is patient zero for personality change from brain injury, and an important milestone in our understanding of the human brain. His exhumed skull holds a place of honor at the Warren Anatomical Museum at Harvard, and neuroscientists continue to study it to this day. Since then, we've learned much about how the brain works and its role in making us who we are. Here are seven things scientists have discovered about this incredible organ. Right away, you can see why I'm interested. I love everything about the brain. This stuff just really uh, gets to my uh, brain working. <laughs> um, it starts with cabbies, a lobectomy, and neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity comes in two varieties, structural plasticity and functional plasticity. Structural plasticity occurs when the brain alters its physical structure through learning and interaction with the environment. Functional plasticity, when the brain moves functions from a damaged area to an undamaged one. We've known about neuroplasticity for a long time, but researchers are only beginning to uncover its potential. Plasticity is actually very powerful. Neuroscientist Michael Merzenich said during his TED talk, This lifelong capacity for plasticity for brain damage is powerfully expressed. It is the basis of our real differentiation, one individual from another. You can look down in the brain of an animal that's engaged in a specific skill, and you can witness or document this change on a variety of levels. Even seemingly mundane tasks have a powerful effect on our brains. In one example of neuroplasticity, neuroscientists compared the brain and scans of London bus and taxi drivers. They discovered that cabbies sport a measurably larger hippocampus. Hippocampus. <laughs> a key area of the brain involved in spatial memory. That's because cabbies develop intricate mental maps of London to navigate their fare's destination. Bus drivers who drive the same route ad nauseum do not. Wow, I must have a huge hippocampus. Holy shit. I've been driving since I'm like fucking, you know, 
19 a lot of my job. Functional plasticity, on the other hand, provides some extreme examples. Gage proved to neuroscientists its premier case study, but there have been many more since. One followed a seven-year-old boy known simply as UD. When UD was four, he began suffering debilitating seizures. When medications did not alleviate them, doctors performed a lobectomy, a lobectomy, a lobotomy, it's all supposed to be lobotomy, uh, lobectomy, and removed the full third of his right hemisphere, including the right occipital lobe. UD's brain compensated for the trauma and began, and began shifting visual tasks to his left hemisphere, including the ability to recognize faces, a task typically performed by the right occipital lobe. I can say. Oh, man. what's old is still new. UD's outstanding recovery was likely aided by his useful brain. And it is true that neuroplasticity declines with age, but a growing body of evidence suggests we've been underestimating elderly gray matter. In a study published last year in Cell Stem Cell, Cell Stem Cell, <laughs> researchers autopsied the hippocampi of 28 people, ages 14 to 79. They found the hippocampi of older subjects still maintain thousands of immature neurons and intermediate neural progenitors. Unlike rodents and primates, humans appear to generate new brain cells well into our twilight years. That's interesting, huh? We found that older people have similar ability to make thousands of hippocampal new neurons from progener progenerated cells as younger people do. Lead author Maura Boldrini said in a release. We also found equivalent volumes of the hippocampus, a brain structure used for emotion and cognition across ages. What caused reduced neuroplasticity in the elderly then? Boldrini postulates they may come from a smaller pool of neuron connections and the formation of fewer new blood vessels. This may not have always been the case, though. Neuroscientists at Tufts University School of Medicine discovered a molecular mechanism, mechanism that directly enforced plasticity in mice brain. By targeting that mechanism, they were able to reestablish plasticity originally thought lost to old age. Wow, that's cool. By the way, there are highlighted sentences which are links to other studies. There's also a voice. Uh, you can listen to the article so you don't have to hear me fucking up words. Anyway, I'll continue. Scientists aren't just unearthing the ways the brain works. They're finding all new features. In a study published last year in Nature Neuroscience, researchers detailed the discovery of a hitherto unknown brain cell. Here it is. <laughs> Called the rose hip neuron, this cell sports compact dendrites with many branching points and makes up about 10% of the neocortex. Its exact function is unclear, but the researchers speculate it could be an inhibitory neuron, meaning it lessens activity in the, that region of the brain. It also remains unclear whether the rose hip neuron is unique to humans. Though it has never been seen in mice or other laboratory animals, if it is unique to people, the rose hip neuron and other potentially secretive cells could explain why treatments that work in mice don't translate to people. We really don't know, we really don't understand what makes the human brain special. Studying the difference, differences at level of cells and circuits is a good place to start. And now we have new tools to do just that. Edlene, study co-led an investigator of the Alien Institute for Brain Science, said in a release. The Allen Institute for Alien If there are aliens in this. Gotta remember them all. Pokemon. As we age, last week can become a hazy blur, while experiences from third grade remain vivid and alive. If you're a child of the 90s, that means Pokemon. Researchers at Stanford University placed adult test subjects in a functional MRI and showed them images of random Pokemon characters. The brains of adults who played Pokemon as children lit up the MRI more than the control group who did not. Pokemon players' brains all activated the same site. The occipital, occipital temporal, 
sulcus, a brain fold behind our ears that responds to images of animals. What was unique about Pokemon is that there are hundreds of characters, and you have to know everything about them in order to play the game successfully. The game rewards you for individuating hundreds of these little, similar-looking characters. Study First author Jesse Gomez said in a release, I figured if you don't get a reason for that, then it's never going to happen. It's not just colorful pocket monsters that leave an incredible impression on our brains. A study published in the Journal of Prevention of Alzheimer's Disease found that music from our youth activates a phenomenon called Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response, ASMR. For people afflicted with Alzheimer's, such music can bring them out of their mental haze. I've seen some of those videos. They're amazing. They supply lots of videos in this article, too. Uh, mindfulness unlocks mental superpowers. Like so many re religious experiences, meditation has come under the scientific lens and has been found to have powerful effects on our brains. <clears throat> I like meditation. I've been a big supporter. Neuroscientist Richard Davison scanned the minds of prominent meditators, i.e. people who have meditated up to 62,000 hours in their lifetime. He found that meditation altered their brain's ability to produce gamma waves, quickly oscillating waves associated with attention and memory, significantly more than the average person. When super meditators were asked to focus on compassion, for example, the gamma levels jumped 700 to 800 percent. These effects weren't limited to when they meditate, either. The gamma brain waves were always heightened. Daniel Coleman, who co authored Altered Traits, with Davison told Big Think, we have to assume that the special state of consciousness that you see in the highest level meditators is a lot like something described in the classical meditation literature centuries ago, which is that there is a state of being which is not like our ordinary state. Laughter is the best medicine for brain surgery. The average four-year-old laughs 300 times a day, while the average adult laughs 17 times a day. Chances are this bit of pop knowledge is exaggerated, but it points to an important truth. The happier, healthier times in our lives are filled with laughter. Laughter triggers the limbic system at the center of our brains, an area that influences emotions, memories, and stimulation. This mental surge is not only emotionally uplifting, it also has physically salubrious results. It reduces pain, boosts heart rate, produces certain antibodies, and improves the function of blood vessel. Neuroscientists at Emory University School of Medicine have even hacked this psychological response, or physiological response, to make awake brain surgery safer. By stimulating the syngolum bundle, a collection of white matter fibers that allow for communication between limbic system components, they cause immediate laughter in their patients followed by a sense of calm and happiness. This helped prevent patients of awake brain surgery from panicking, making for a safer operation. If laughter can uplift someone with a doctor literally poking around in their head, imagine what it can do for the rest of us. Memory is a disease. While it may have originated with a virus at any rate, an international team of researchers recently reassessed R a protein essential to memory formation. When researchers looked at how the protein assembles itself, they found that it has properties akin to a virus infecting its host. We went into this line of research knowing that ARC was special in many ways. But when we discovered that ARC was able to mediate cell-to-cell -cell transport of RNA, we were floored. Postdoctoral fellow Alyssa Patsunin Patsuzin, the study lead author said in a release, no other non-viral protein that we know of acts in this way. Specifically, it looks a lot like how the HIV retrovirus operates. The researchers hypothesized that 300 to 400 million years ago, an ancestor to retroviruses, dubbed retrotransposons. <laughs> I read these things before, you know, this is fucking, uh, and I still fuck up these words inserted genetic material into animals' DNA. This led to the development of ARC in mammalian, uh, mammalian's brains today, including humans. Without ARC, 
Long-term memories cannot be solidified, so in a way, memories infect our brains. Oh, this, I, this stuff just really gets me. You know what that really means? I mean, yes, if you want to go into this, we can go and see every link here. We can go into the nitty-gritty of what is hyperbole. Some of these are peer-reviewed, maybe, studies, and they're not leading to other breakthroughs. But I think in the general sense, this is like where they see the evidence going, but it's fascinating. The Human Brain 101. Learning about the brain is a challenge. Neuroscientists are trying to measure the operations of a complex tool using the very tool they are trying to measure. It is no easy task. Yet in the last half century, they have accumulated a vast amount of knowledge about the human brain. Yet many mysteries remain. We don't know what consciousness is, where it comes from, or how it evolved. So we don't understand how the human brain can outcompete so many others in the animal kingdom. And although we've thought long and hard about it, we still don't know what it really is. Well, we still don't know what thought really is. Despite these several, seven incredible facts, we're only at the introductory course of our understanding. We still have much to learn about the human brain. That ends the article. Now, I love this stuff. Like I said, I caught on to this from a, a Facebook. It was a Facebook um, post by, you know, some science, maybe IFL science. And I was looking at it about how name change, how an infant's memory encodes objects. And it was um, how just by how you teach your children about certain things and how you use the names to categorize them. It affects their memory. And I had a friend I was talking to a while ago. Well, it's been years now, obviously. But um, my, uh, my, my instinct was always to get people, parents, obviously, aware of the developmental stages of the human brain. Now, this is all not... There are outliers to everything. It doesn't mean every single case is the same. But if you as a parent, as a person in, in everyday life, if you can just like kind of get an understanding of, oh, okay, so this is what's going on in an infant's brain up to, let's say, three years old. And from three to seven, you kind of understand how the brain is working. And this is not mystery stuff to um, theorize or come up with uh, things. This is actual data. It's science. It's evolutionary biology evolutionary psychology to a certain extent i guess but we kind of know how these things are working and we're getting better at it so i implore everybody to look into these things if it's not for you for your children how better to make them learn if they have little uh, shortcomings you'll find them sooner if they excel in things you might even um you know jump on that ahead of time and really focus it there's a lot of things that the brain does, and we're finding out that they do it into the old age, which is fascinating to me. You know, we keep getting further and further with technology. We're going to get better at all these little things, and the human brain is where it's all at. In my opinion, everything is chemicals. Everything is, you know... The way these things work together, we can get into debates about uh, free will and uh, all the philosophy points of things. But in a general sense, we have the scientific method. We're looking at the brain. There's so much we don't know what thought is, and as the article describes, but we keep striving to learn. We keep doing more studies, and these things fascinate me. There's so much to learn about the brain, and not even saying every person has to become a psychologist or a therapist or a neuroscientist but understanding that there is ways to hijack the system to make it better and you can also do this and it makes it worse we know what indoctrinating children does we know how how much it works look what it does to people and it doesn't always ring true that it goes back to the past and we can correlate this or that, but we do have an understanding now. And yes, there were insight gains in the past that we can learn about and we use, but we have to be 
realist now, the day and age we're in. I talk about it here and there lately because there's been a pandemic, there's people out of work, there's all just craziness in the American politics, world politics is all nuts. And doling out a little bit of information and reading these articles it always gets my mind back to the important things for me. And that is to get to know yourself, to get to know how your processes work. Just understanding it on a, you know, a surface level to make you a better person, better parent. So this was seven new things about the brain and what we've learned. And there are so many article links in this. It is a, um, you know, a wealth of information. I implore people to hit the link. They probably read the article better than I do. I don't see, uh, you know, I so I try to because I they come across my attention. I'll bookmark it or put it into a notepad thing, and then I'll read it again and even reading it again. I'm like, you know, some pothead burnout in Brooklyn, New York, and they probably read it better. But there are tons of links, and the links lead to other links, and you can get really studious and confirm some of these things you can get an idea of what might be um just a you know clickbait and what makes something you know not as verified as another but these type of articles this knowledge that we're gaining i really hope people enjoy it i hope everybody's doing well be safe i'll talk to everybody next time take care